All right, what's happening, fam? As you can tell from the title, this is going to be an interesting video. Now, the reason why this video caught my attention is because it's very similar to what we're dealing with here in the U.S. with the Latinos in reference to is hip-hop Black American culture. Here we have a British guy. His name is Andrew Edwards. And he's making this claim that jazz is not Black American music or Black music. And so he goes on to lay out his positioning as to why he doesn't believe so. But what's very interesting, 11 months earlier, he made a video where he clearly said that it does come from African-Americans. So I don't know what's going on. Now, at first take, Andrew seems to be a well-versed intellectual guy. Um, I understand that he's a, a drummer, very good drummer, a very good jazz enthusiast, knows a lot about the music, knows a lot about the history. But somewhere, somehow, he got off the wagon. And now he believes that we shouldn't call jazz Black American music. He makes a reference to the term jazz, that it wasn't created by black musicians. And he makes a, a, a reference to Miles Davis and a gentleman named Nicholas Payton, who has said that they believe jazz is black American music. And that's what I believe. Now, Andrew doesn't believe that either. He believes that it's basically a mixture of cultures that created and developed jazz. So we're going to test a lot of his theories and, his, and many of his beliefs. In order to understand the, the meaning or the definition of jazz, we have to understand what makes jazz jazz. So let's listen to what Wynton Marsalis has to say about what jazz is. How do you define jazz? Um, but in your own mind, three, I don't mean to look, you know. Three, three elements of jazz that have to be present. Uh, uh, one is improvisation, which is the I part, it's freedom to express yourself. The second is swing, which is the opposite of the I, it's the us. And swing is a matter of coordination and balance. It, it teaches you diplomacy. Yes, you have freedom, but other people have freedom too. So how y'all going to get that together? How is your freedom going to go from yours to ours? So as you revel in that improvisation, oh, I can play with an owl, you playing too. <laughs> then the blues. The blues aesthetic is our spiritual overview, which is optimism in the face of adversity and an optimism that's not naive, which is that we, this, is, this is life. Bad things happen. That's a fact of being alive. There's no perfection. If you're out here, you're paying dues. And how do you deal with those dues? And how do you use what you have to, to, to be resilient? and to, to deepen your humanity through the tragedy and the struggles. And how can you express the depth of that humanity that is earned in a way that will uplift people and give them a, a, a generosity, this is to, to exhibit a generosity of feeling and, and uh, a generosity of spirit and a depth of feeling that we call soul that comes out of the blues aesthetic. And it's also very essential ingredient uh, to our music. And when it's not present, even if you're a great improviser, even if you can swing, you're not in that line. Those all three of those things must be present. That's incredible. Uh, yes, sir. Jasmine. So there you have it. The elements that Witten says are necessary for jazz. And guess what? All of those elements are found in the Black American tradition, music tradition. They're not found in European music tradition or Latin American music tradition or Native American music tradition. Those elements are only found in Black American music traditions. Let me go through a few examples of what I'm talking about. Now, let's take a moment and try to analyze what makes jazz jazz. All right. Some people think it's just a melody or something that you just utilize and there you have jazz. But that's not what jazz is. Basically, jazz is how you interpret music. 
and what techniques you use to express yourself in that music. All right. Now, when we talk about certain elements that you find in jazz, you can't do jazz if you're not aware of two major scales. The bebop scale and the blues scale. You're not doing jazz if you don't know those scales. All right. Number two, reharmonization. That's a technique that was developed amongst black Americans. That's that tradition doesn't come from Europe. It doesn't come from Latin America or Native Americans. We have to be clear when we talk about European music, their music was written down and they had to play exactly what was written down. The idea of comping, that's from us as well. Ability to improvise, soloing, that's us. That doesn't come from them. All right. Alter chords. When we talk about flats, sevens and nines and and thirteens and six nines and augmented fifths and ninths and, and all of that. That comes out of our tradition, out of reharmonization ideas. That didn't exist prior to us. So when you look at all the elements and techniques that are essential for playing jazz, it comes from one group of people, Black American. Let's take a moment and um, analyze Andrew's position when it comes to whether or not jazz should be called black music. He seems to have this belief that the reason why we shouldn't call it black music because it didn't come from Africa. Jazz doesn't come from Africa, so why would we even call it black music? Andrew, listen, buddy, buddy, listen. Although the majority of black people in America are of African descent, we are not Africans. We were enslaved in this country for nearly 300 years. And through that period of time, we develop a culture that is uniquely black American. Okay? So, this is why you can't trace it to Africa. But to try to say that America or Europe was that influential and in how jazz came to be is an overreach because all you did was offer a melody or two. But again, like I, like Whitney Marcellus has said, and as I have said, is how you interpret that melody. So when you talk about the, the Celtic songs or the folk songs from Ireland that found its way into the blues, that doesn't make any sense because the Celtic music by itself is not jazz. What makes it jazz again is how it's interpreted. So to suggest that Europeans should get credit for creating a way of interpreting music. It's crazy because the only people that were that was interpreting music in the way jazz is known for was black Americans. All right. So let's not mix influence with collaboration. And what I mean by that. There were no Europeans mixing with black Americans and saying, let's come up with this new way of, of interpreting music. That didn't happen. Nowhere in history did that happen. So when you talk about influence, I would agree with you that there were influences, especially when you talk about New Orleans, where you had a multicultural cultural, uh, phenomenon and there was music everywhere different sounds from different people. But those sounds from those different people is not jazz. Think about it this way, Andrew. All those people in New Orleans had access to the same influences that Black Americans had. So how is it that black Americans were the only people to harness 
whatever influences that, that they were and interpret those influences and created something that didn't exist before. You need to understand the difference between influence and collaboration. If you wasn't in the woodshed with those brothers, you cannot get credit for creating jazz. Therefore, jazz is a black American music. Now, if that wasn't enough, he says, well, you know what? To call it black music, that's racist. Don't you black people want to get away from racial terms and racial identity politics? Wouldn't, wouldn't it be a better world if we could get away from that? But Andrew, that's not the world that we live in. Now, when it comes to the things that are said about blacks that are negative, like they're born criminals, that they're deviant, and all of the negative things that are said about black people all over the world, you don't look at us as individuals. Everybody look at us as a collective. But when it comes to the creative genius that we produce, now you don't want people to look at black people as a collective. Now we're individuals now. So we shouldn't call it black music because we're talking about individuals. Not every black person is playing jazz. So why are we saying this music is black music? You see the, the hypocrisy in that statement. Only the good things you want, you want us to relieve ourselves of our heritage, but the negative things you want us to hold on to. We're not playing that. He makes this other argument. Don't you want to live in a colorblind society? Isn't that what we should be striving for? Why call it black music? Why can't it be everybody's music? And Andrew, it always has been. Why are you hung up on race? There are no black people going around saying, oh, we're going to introduce this music as black music. No one is doing that. This music was created for everybody to enjoy. So why are you picking this fight? For what? It makes no sense whatsoever. And then they quote people like Martin Luther King about, you know, judging people by their character, not by their skin color, trying to shame black people for accepting this notion that we shouldn't uh, hold on to our accomplishments, that we should be willing to relinquish our legacy for the sake of a colorblind society. Many white people are misinterpreting what Dr. King has said. People do take liberties to kind of take different quotes to fit their situation. Um, and nothing is more frustrating for me than that. Um, you know, yeah. I say to people, if you're gonna, if you're gonna use his words, try to find the context of those words that he used them in. For instance, when he when he talked about rice being the language of the unheard, he was not justifying and saying that he endorsed riots. Um, he was explaining where the riots are coming from. The other one that gets taken out of context all the time is, you know, I have a dream that my four children would one day live in a nation where they would not be judged by the color of their skin, by the content, by the content of their character. And people are always saying Dr. King was for a colorblind America and nothing could be further from the truth. I mean, he was basically explaining that, no, there's a beauty in who I am as a black person, but I should not be judged in, in, by those standards. Um, and so it's not that you don't see my race, you yeah. see my race, you acknowledge my race and you accept everything I bring along with that. The beauty of the movement. So this is what a lot of right wingers do. They take Dr. Martin Luther King's words out of context and they flip it to make it appear as color blindness means not to acknowledge race. So his daughter sets the record straight.
Now, like I acknowledged before, there were certainly influences from a lot of different people. But again, I got to keep stressing this. Influence by itself is not jazz. So, for example, Wynton Marcel is going to give a, a uh, demonstration. He's discussing Buddy Bolden. But he's going to take a European composition, which is Stars and Stripes Forever, and you're going to hear it played the way it was written, but the interpretation of it is jazz. Before you go, don't 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 go don't 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 go don't oh. So on that fourth beat, the drum and the cymbal hit together, and that point is where jazz music started to really get its lilt. Before the, the trumpets, they, they were playing. So when I phrase it, I'm going to make it sound like me and I'm going to play with another entire feeling and groove and use all the different growls and shouts and cries. So now it becomes. sound not like trumpet but like buddy bolden now you also are listening to the clarinet and so now you understand what i mean by what makes it jazz is interpretation and that way of interpreting music comes from black american or black america so let's be clear this doesn't come from europe it doesn't come from asia it doesn't come from native americans this way of interpret interpreting music doesn't come from those people. Black Americans develop this way of interpreting music. Phil Schaap here with you. I'm the curator of Jazz and Lincoln Center. I've been trying to explain to you, dear people, why New Orleans is jazz's birthplace. And I'm pretty much ready to jump into the music itself. It's an unusual city, New Orleans, with its colonial background, with its approach to slavery, that sordid tale of our past, with the magnificence of the mighty Mississippi and the open access to the ocean through the port of New Orleans, and through the genius of Buddy Bolden, who in the 1890s and the first years of the 20th century played music with a new zestiness that is the rhythm and birth of the music jazz. Jazz has a rich mythological tradition. It's full of tales of good and evil, struggle and triumph, of comedy and tragedy. And it's got a deep pantheon of gods and heroes, men and women who have tapped into something so beautiful, so pure with their music that they transcended mortality itself. Of course, because the story of jazz is the story of the modern age, we usually know the truth behind these legends. But there's one figure in jazz who has slipped almost entirely into myth. He was a man who lived at the turn of the century and blew horn lines so loud and so hot that they changed the course of history. He was the first true virtuoso of jazz music and a man whose tragic life story would be echoed by the greats who followed in his footsteps. And he's a mystery that jazz has been trying to unravel for generations. His name was Charles Buddy Bolden, but to many he was known better as King Bolden. And to some, he is known simply as the man who invented jazz. Wetton Barcel is my hero. Welcome <laughs> yes, to the show. Man, it's such a pleasure. Good to see such you. Good to see you. Yes, sir. So, Buddy Bolden, man, he's finally getting his due. You're doing a movie on him. And the theme is, he invented jazz. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? What ingredients did he put together? I think he's the first person who realized you could take church music, like Afro-American church sanctified music, and put it together with the sounds of the street. So he put two opposites together. He played cornet solo. That's a cornet you got right there, cornet. yeah, yeah. 
So yeah, one 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 form of music is more like uh, like hollering and shouting with effects, maybe like. And that's like kind of a, a style of playing the blues and bending notes. You have another style that's very straight and sweet swung, a song style that's like a. Then you have another style that's like a ragtime style, which would be. So he, he put these kind of ragtime styles, the sound of street parades, hymns, marches, church music, that sensibility in the blues. He put all those things together. And we're talking about the 1890s or so in Treme and Central City, New Orleans. 1890s uptown. Uptown. So he was, yeah, he's an uptown musician, Johnson Park. So I want to put these series of clips together to show you what the consensus is as to who the jazz world believes created jazz or at least started jazz in the way we know it today. And it's clearly Buddy Bolden. And as you heard how Witten Marcellus described the ingredients, all of those ingredients for the most part come from Black American culture. I got to keep driving this point because it's not about European culture. We're going to get into that a little bit later. We're going to talk about the culture of, of New Orleans amongst the Europeans. Andrew Edwards makes the case that Europe played an important role in the development of jazz. I think it's important to examine the music culture of 19th century New Orleans in order to really determine whether or not that's true. I don't see anything in European culture that would lend itself to the development of jazz. Okay, you got to remember what was going on in Europe was also going on in New Orleans in terms of the music culture. We're talking about operas, orchestras, symphonies, classical music. That was the culture or the music culture during that period. I would argue, how could that culture could have created jazz? It's not possible. When you look at the, the terms of harmonies that are used in jazz versus the harmonies that are used in a classical music, there's no stride piano in classical music that's something that was developed by black Americans. So you have to understand when you examine the techniques that are used between the two cultures, it's impossible to suggest that jazz came from Europeans. Let's look at the music culture in more detail. Uh, I knew nothing about New Orleans music. I had been here two years in the city, and I was working on Spanish music, and I was planning to go to Spain for a summer. And I was at a meeting in New York where the leading Spanish-American scholar, Robert Stevenson, was, and I asked him if could he give me some hints uh, where to go in Spain. He looked at me and said, why are you going to Europe when you're sitting in the most important city for music in America? And I said, well, that's very nice. I'm not into jazz particularly. That's not my thing. He looked at me and said, look at Chopin's Opus 7, Circus, dedicated to Monsieur Jean de Nouveau Orléans, to Mr. John's in New Orleans. He said, who was that guy? So I started doing research. That is 71, 72. I started doing research on John's. I won't tell you who he is. You have to read the book. <laughs> back and, and started with the newspapers and tried to cover every newspaper for the years 1800 to 1897. Fortunately, in the 19th century, they published the programs of every concert in advance of the concert in the newspaper so people could decide if they wanted to go. 
one city for opera in America in the 19th century is New Orleans. But uh, there's also discovered symphony orchestras, concert seasons, chamber music, solo recitals, famous artists from all over the world would come to New Orleans, many times skipping New York or skipping other big cities at that time. Typical was Anton Rubinstein, who was in the 1870s one of Europe's two or three greatest pianists. When he traveled all over America in 1872-73, uh, he was met by crowds everywhere. But when he came to New Orleans, he wrote back to his mother in Russia, I have finally reached a musical city. I have finally reached a cultivated, cultured place. Again, in the end of the 18th century, with the arrival of the Haitians, the Santo Domingo, and uh, they brought with them their, their taste for European music and, and theater. And uh, by 1796, there was the first opera. And following that, you can see a steady rise, uh, traced in my book, of course, until the 18, late 1830s, when the city finally had reached a status. Uh, and all along the way, no other city in America could rival New Orleans. What I find interesting about Andrew's point about minstrel shows is that he seems to suggest that Europeans should get credit for introducing this form of entertainment to the world, or at least to the United States, and then saying because of it, that shows a European influence in the development of jazz. Now, we all know what minstrel shows were about. It was simply taking aspects of black culture and creating an entertainment industry out of it. Now, to suggest that a European should get credit for mimicking black culture and say that they actually contribute to the development of jazz, I find that totally ridiculous. Despite its overt racism, the minstrel show was a blend of lively music, knockabout comedy, and sophisticated elegance. A bizarre and complicated ritual in which blacks and whites alike would interpret and misinterpret each other for decades. I think that there's something that was so resilient in the black people, and that everyone in America could recognize that resilience. And even though it was masquerading, uh, farce and comedy and dance and a form of music, and it seemed like it was uncomplimentary, actually, there was something centrally American about it. And that was the beginning of a long relationship between blacks and whites and black entertainment and white appropriation of it. And this strange dance that we've been doing with each other since really the beginning of our relationship in America. It's too close, it's too deep a story. So you have to degrade the relationship. You have to do degrading things so that you can live with the tremendous affront to humanity that slavery was. The first big minstrel hit was written down and performed by a white man known as Daddy Rice, who said he'd first heard it being sung by a black stable hand. Rice named the tune after the man, Jim Crow. Why is the jazz music, and therefore the jazz band? As well ask, why is the dime novel, or the grease-dripping donut? All are manifestations of a low streak in man's tastes that has not yet come out in civilization's wash. In the matter of jazz, New Orleans is particularly interested, since it has been widely suggested that this particular form of musical vice had its birth in this city. We do not recognize the honor of parenthood, but with such a story in circulation, 
it behooves us to be the last to accept the atrocity in polite society. New Orleans Times, Picky You. The music that Buddy Bolden and Jelly Roll Morton had played in New Orleans was sometimes called ratty music or gut bucket music. To others, it was just hot music, filled with energy and fire. But some soon began to call it jazz. Now, just think about this. If Europeans saying they helped create it, why did they have such a negative reaction to it? This clearly demonstrates that they had nothing to do with its creation. Papa Jack Lane. He is called the father of white jazz by some writers and historians. There's no doubt of his importance in the early history of brass bands and jazz in New Orleans. Let me read on. Some have taken credit for eventing jazz. Most people will tell you that black musicians around New Orleans started jazz. Early black musicians credit their fellow musicians within the development of jazz. There are a few that say it was the early spasm bands of some young white musicians. The early beginnings of jazz can only be theorized, never proven as to its origins or the exact facts surrounding jazz birth. Now, I disagree with that last statement. All you got to do is remember what Whitten Marcellus said about the ingredients or the components that make up jazz. None of that comes from European culture. It's clearly born out of Black American music tradition. Now, listen to this. Now, I'm getting this from a, a Facebook post. The, the author is not recognized here, but um, you can find it on Facebook. Matter of fact, I'll probably leave a, a link to it in the description. Okay, here we go. Black and white musicians did not usually play in the same band when marching in New Orleans parades and other musical activities. There were crossovers, those very light-skinned blacks who were taken as being white. Lane had a few of these as regular members of his band, including was Dave Perkins, Achilles and George Bache, Baptiste Acoin, Gil Rouge. The importance of these crossover playing in Lane's bands cannot be overlooked. They also performed with the leading black bands in New Orleans. There was a time when definitely when Jim Crow was instituted, these classically trained Creoles could no longer play in the opera houses. And they were forced to play with the black musicians. Now they could play both sides of the fence because they were of course Creoles. Let me continue. The importance, the importance. Lane's white musicians were exposed to black band experience through associations with these men. Also, these men brought with brought the white band experience to the black community. I kind of wonder what that was, but nevertheless, that's what the author says. While Lane stated he didn't hear many black bands, he had within his group the influence produced by black musicians. This by band experience bridged the gap between Lane's white band and the black band tradition, putting Lane in a very influential important position in the evolvement of New Orleans brass bands that developed in the early jazz bands. Now, there's no evidence to my knowledge that a person like Sidney Bechet ever played with Papa Jack Lane, but he would be the kind of member that would be in his band as well as the black bands as well. And so, you had this crossover effect that lent itself very favorably to the white musicians. This is why they sound just as good as the black musician because of this crossover effect. <laughs> 
Now, according to Andy, he says that Bashe felt that he was white. Now, if you look at him, I don't see why he would think that. And why would he even say that he believes jazz comes from France? Clearly, he suffered from some identity crisis. I don't know what that's all about. Like I said from the onset, there is no question there were a lot of influences in the air, but it was the black American who harnessed those influences, those melodies and fashioned a style of music that never existed before. Let me read this little excerpt from a uh, article entitled the brass bands, the black brass bands of new Orleans. And this speaks to, the influences, and I'm not shying away from that, but we have to understand, you know, who fashioned these ideas, who harnessed these ideas, wherever they may be, all right? The development of New Orleans brass bands was inter intertwined with a new musical form that emerged around 1900. Jazz synthesized ragtime, blues, spirituals, marches, European dance, Latin American rhythms, and um, American popular songs, and specifically African American musical style. Its emphasis, collective improvisation, audience participation, rhythmic syncopation and repetition, and the use of pentatonic scales and blue notes. The brass band was formed was formative influence in the early jazz of Jelly Roll Morton, Louis Armstrong, Sidney Bechet, and virtually every other early jazz musician performed in brass bands. In addition, most jazz bands, including those of Buddy Bolden and Kid Ory, doubled as brass bands with minor modifications, typically substituting the rhythm section of piano, brass, and banjo for tuba and drums. In turn, jazz performance styles influenced in New Orleans brass bands, allowing it to develop as the most significant black brass band tradition in the United States. See, I'm of the belief that if it were not for jazz, American music would be very similar to European music, mostly classical. So let's talk about what did jazz do for the European? Within weeks, you had six songs using the word jazz in them. Irving Berlin was writing songs to catch on to this new fad. Americans almost immediately were jazz crazy. As it began to spread across the country, it was clear that this was the kind of music that people wanted for dancing. So that if you were going to be a dance band musician at all, you had to, you had to play jazz. But what was really important about this was the way that the young people all over the United States were simply swept up by this new music. The new music, whose roots ran back beyond Congo Square, was at last being heard by all Americans. New bands sprang up everywhere. The Louisiana Five, the original Memphis Five, the New Orleans Rhythm Kings, the New Orleans Kings of Rhythm, and the original New Orleans Jazz Band, organized by a ragtime piano player born and bred in Brooklyn named Jimmy Durante. It was a new century, and there were high hopes, and young people really wanted that kind of freedom to create a culture of their own. And this is really the first time in American history that that happened. It was a way for people to break with the old. It was a way to break from Europe 
It was a way to break from old Victorian mores. It was a way to break from a whole bunch of other stuff. It was, it was sort of clean in that respect. And America no longer had to look back to its past, no longer had to look back to Europe or anything else. Black people, when they invented this music, weren't looking back to Africa. They were looking at America and looking at the future and looking at what they were as Americans. Europeans who came to this country and became Americans who were attracted to this music, found in this music a way to break from Europe. Finally, the Emersonian doctrine of create your art here from the American scholar finally came to fruition with this music. The original Dixieland jazz band now builds itself as the creators of jazz and undertook a tour of England. They were a sensation there too. But the band slowly fell apart. Eddie Edwards, the trombone player, was drafted into the army in 1918. The pianist, Henry Ragas, died of influenza in 1919. Larry Shields, the clarinet player, quit in 1921, weary of the road. And in 1925, Nick LaRocca himself would suffer a nervous breakdown, abandon the road, and return to the construction business in New Orleans as if he had never been a musician. But until the day he died, LaRocca would insist that his music and all jazz music had been an exclusively white creation. Black people, he said, had had nothing to do with it. Many writers have attributed this rhythm that we introduced as something coming from the African jungles and crediting the Negro race with it. My contention is that the Negroes learned to play this rhythm and music from the whites. The Negro did not play any kind of music equal to white men at any time. Nick LaRocca. Well... Race is a, race is like, for this country, it's like a, the thing in the story, in the mythology that you have to do for the kingdom to be well. And it's always something you don't want to do. And it's always that thing that's so much about you confronting yourself that is tailor-made for you to fail dealing with it. And the question of your heroism and of your courage and of your, of your success at dealing with this trial is can you confront it with honesty? And do you confront it and do you have the energy to sustain an attack on it? And since jazz music is at the center of the American mythology, it necessarily deals with race. The more we run from it, the more we run into it. It's an age old story. You know, if it's not race, it's something else. But in this particular instance, in this nation, it is race. You know, when we think about white supremacy, we think it only affects black people. But in reality, it affects white people as well. How does it affect white people? It traps them in the sense of feeling superior that they cannot allow themselves to see people they feel that are inferior having the same abilities and intellect as they. Because if you are fed this message constantly that black people are beneath you, incapable of producing great things, it's hard to accept the notion that a music that you enjoy and that you value, it's hard for you to say that comes from black people. To you, all great things come from white people. Despite the obvious, the evidence is clear that it comes from black American music tradition, but he chooses to avoid that fact because being superior is what counts.
check out this quote and ask yourself this question. If a people truly felt that they produce jazz, why would they say things such as this? And I'll close with this. Nineteen thirteen, the New York Herald. Can it be said that America is falling prey to the collective soul of the Negro through the influence of what is popularly known as ragtime music? If there is any tendency towards such a national disaster, it should be definitely pointed out and extreme measures taken to inhibit the influence and avert the increasing danger, if it has not already gone too far. American ragtime music is symbolic of the primitive morality and perceptible moral limitations of the Negro type.